Okay. Hi, everyone. Again, this is Jessica Frank with the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction, and I am Ada J. Authors Program Manager. Today's new user webinar is going to cover functions and macros in Ada J. Author 6. Just a reminder, you all are on mute. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Otherwise, you can put your questions or your comments in the chat box and I will check that periodically and we'll have time at the end for questions. If you are calling in by phone, make sure to enter your audio pin so that you can be heard if you are unmuted. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash a to j author. And I've also included the slide deck that you were going to go through today in the handout section of your GoToMeeting control panel. So if you open the small control panel that is likely on the right side of your screen, there is um, a section called handouts and you can download the PDF version of this slide deck. On our agenda today, first we'll cover variable macros. What are they, the format for using them, where you can use them in an A to J guided interview, and how you can customize your interview using macros. The second part of our agenda today will cover functions. What are they, where can you use them? And specifically, we'll focus on age, date, today, has answered, contains, ordinal, and sum. Um, and then we'll go over syntax reminders and additional resources because I'm not covering all the functions that exist in A to J author. I will show you at the end in the additional resources section where you can find all of the functions in our A to J authoring guide. And um, it has an explanation of what that function does and how to use it in an interview. So to kick off, we'll start with variable macros. Uh, what is a variable macro? A variable macro is a way to call up the value of a variable in question text, learn more prompts, learn more answers, field labels, radio buttons, and signposts. It's a way for you as the author to personalize a guided interview, giving the end user back information that they've already told you. It really takes an interview up a notch from just being a basic um, question and answer back and forth kind of thing to feeling more like an actual um, interaction with between the end user and the guide avatar. So this is an example here of the most common way that a macro is used. It's calling out the end user's name. You've asked them in, a, in one of the beginning questions, what is their name? Then use that information later on. So for example, here I've used a macro to call out um, Jessica. So Jessica, what is the name of the first person you want to be your agent? It's just a way to add that extra level of personalization uh, for your end user. The format for using a macro is fairly simple. It is wrapping a variable name in brackets and then wrapping it in percent signs and double percent signs. So percent sign, percent sign, open bracket, variable name, close bracket, percent sign, percent sign. And you can see an example of it, um, the exact same one that I just showed you calling out the end user's first name is this is an example, a, a screenshot from the text of a question in which I used um, that macro. And we'll talk a little bit at the end of this section about things to remember, but uh, double percent signs and always wrap it in brackets. So you can use a variable macro in the question text. You can use it in the learn more prompt, which is new in A to J6. In A to J4, it used to throw up an error where it would actually just show the code. It wouldn't show the value. Um, and so uh, this is a new feature in 6. The prompt is what the end user thinks, the little thought bubble um, that then has learn more button underneath it. The learn more help is the answer that the end that the guide avatar gives to the end user based on that prompt. You can use a macro in radio buttons, field labels, and signposts. And I'll show you examples of all of these. At any time, if I'm going too fast, feel free to raise your hand um, or put a question in the chat box and I will stop and we'll go over it. So as I said, the most common is the example of calling out the end user's first name or their full name um, in a question text or calling out some sort of name. So Jessica, what is the name of the first person you want to be your agent? And again, the example, a screenshot of the text section. 
the Learn More prompt. So here's an example where in the top screenshot is from the author side and putting in why would I want, percent sign, percent sign, bracket, name of the variable I want to call out, um, the close bracket, close double percent sign, and then just finish the sentence. And here is how it displays in the second screenshot at the bottom, how it would look to the end user if they had told me that agent primary TE um, was named Jane Doe. Here it is in the learn more help. So the help section, the top screenshot again is author, the author side and how it would look to you as you're programming it. And the bottom screenshot is how it would look to your end user as they're going through it. Uh, assuming Jane Doe is the name they've given for agent primary TE. Just checking questions real quick, the question panel. Okay. The other common way um, is in the next two screenshots is using the information they've given you about an answer to make that an option that they can pick either in a radio button or in a field label. So here, before this question, I asked the end user who did they want to be their first agent and who did they want to be their second agent. And then I took those names stored in agent 1 TE and agent 2 TE and I used them as the label of a radio button. So which of these people would you like to be your primary agent, Jane or Jack? And this is an easier way for your end user to remember who they told you was agent one and agent two. So if I didn't use a macro, um, it would the question would be something like, which of these people would you like to be your primary agent, agent one or agent two? And say they stopped halfway through, they got distracted, um, they switched tabs, they're not paying attention, they don't remember who agent one was. They'd have to click back and then come forward again to figure it out. Um, instead, just use the information they've already given you. This is really no harder than typing in um, any other label for a radio button. So this is a great way to help end users recall information. It's also great for using this kind of thing in um, repeat loops to remind them, say if you're asking them questions about their children and they may have multiple children and there's multiple questions about each child, use a macro to call out the name of the child you're talking about in a specific round. Now um, I'll show you that in a second. Here is a field label. So this, instead of being uh, field type radio buttons, it's field type text, long, and um, it's the same thing. You use the label to say the value held by agent primary TE, and then I want the words legal powers with a colon after it. And so whatever they type in will be saved as the variable file status MC, but it helps them understand and remember who they're talking about, who they said is their primary agent. Finally, sorry, that first screenshot is a little distorted. Um, the You can use macros to call out step sign or to change the label of a step sign. So by default, your step signs you set under the steps tab, they stay the same throughout the interview but perhaps you wanna add that extra little bit. When you're talking about their spouse's information, you can use the name they've given you for their spouse to change the step sign. Or at the end, if you wanna say, congratulations, user's name, you finished, something like that. You can change the label. And you use uh, A to J variables, which are ones that you don't create, you don't have to worry about, they're already in there. Uh, A to J step one, A to J step two, step three, et cetera, all the way up to step. 13, um, step 0 through 12, so there's 13 steps. Um, to set logic, a condition here, so this is before the step that, uh, the, before the question that is the first question in this step, I have logic that sets, hello, to, sets step 1 to hello plus a space plus the client first name. So this is a way to call out the value of client first name and add it to a step sign. Notice here when I use a macro in logic, I do not include the double percent signs. You don't need to do that in logic. So as I mentioned, interview this, the whole point of variable macros is for interview customization. And the, most, the, the easiest way to do it is to just throw it in um, with the user's name. That's the quickest little way that you can add in a macro and start to personalize your interview. To get a little bit more complex, 
you can use it in a loop for personal information. As I mentioned, say there's a loop for children and you're collecting multiple information about uh, items of information about the children. You can say, what is Jane's birthday? What is Joey's birthday? Who is Bobby's father? That kind of thing to help um, remind the end user. You can display information that has been collected in a loop to the end user in a learn more. So the most common way that I use that is in questions about assets. So um, do you have an asset over $100? Yes, they tell me what it is. Next question is, do you have any more? You can have a learn more that says, which ones have I told you about already? And you use a variable macro to call out all of the values held by asset name TE. And it, when you use a macro um, that is repeated, that has uh, multiple values held in it, like a repeat loop variable, A to J will add the comma and the word and when it displays it to the end user. So if they've told you about their house, their car, and their jet ski, A to J will put a comma after house, a comma after car, and the word and between car and jet ski. So you don't have to worry about uh, proper grammar in uh, a macro. You can also use it to uh, call out words. Instead of saying child slash children asset with the S in um, parentheses is slash R, you can determine based on the user's answers what the appropriate word is, set a new variable called child or children TE to either child or children based on how many kids they have, and then use that proper word um, when you're referring to them in a question. So how many um, or do all of your children go to the same school? Instead of saying, do all of your child slash children uh, go slash goes to the same school? That doesn't, um, that it's just cleaner for making your interview. So before I move on to functions, are there any questions about uh, macros? Okay, not seeing any. So we can move on to functions. A function uh, basically are built-in actions performed to alter the data collected. Basic format for all functions is whatever the function is, its name, all in caps, parentheses, brackets around the variable name, close brackets, close parentheses. In actuality, you only have to have brackets around the variable's name if there is a space in the variable name, but based on the standard naming convention that this community uses, um, it's always a good idea to wrap your variables in brackets um, just to make sure that you don't screw that up um, if there is a space. So I always wrap mine in brackets. Where can you use functions? So the most common place functions are used is in the logic section in writing conditions or script statements. So for example, age, converting a date of birth to a number in years, testing whether that number is greater than or less than another number, and branching people based on the results of that uh, condition. So here, I'll, I'll talk about an age, but what's this, what this is showing is that if their birth date converted to a number is less than 18, they go to you don't qualify question, um, otherwise they go on to the next uh, question in the line. The other way to use functions is in question text. So what I'm doing here is I am uh, converting, or I'm taking the, the date they told me they got the notice, I'm adding 30 physical days to it, it's not, it's 30 calendar days, not um, 30 business days or court holidays are not included, it's 30 actual days. Um, and then converting that number back into a date and so that I can display to the end user the actual date. So instead of saying you must file a response by 30 days after your notice, I can just tell them you have to file a response by 8-31-2017. That's much easier than having them have to figure out what 30 days means, just tell them the date, and it's pretty simple, simple logic to do, do so. This is that age function, so this is the first one we'll talk about. So this converts a date to an age in years. So the example I always give is the one I just showed. Um, if the form requires a birth date for the user and is also limited to people who are over 18 only, then instead of asking someone who would be a successful end user, someone who's over 18 and can use the form, 
if you'd have to ask them two questions. Are you over 18 and what's your birth date? So instead of asking the successful person two questions, just ask them one question, ask everybody one question, what's your birth date? And then do logic to f use a, the age function to test whether they're over 18 or not. This is just a, uh, one less question that your successful end user would need to answer then. And so it just again makes the interview easier. The syntax is age, parentheses, and then wrapping the bracket in variables. Or excuse me, wrapping the variable in brackets. Date converts uh, a, the number of days into a month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. This um, allows you to determine a deadline, like I said, for the answer 30 days from the notice date. And here is an example with the syntax of date, parentheses, bracket, variable date, plus 30 or plus 90, plus whatever your um, condition is, close parentheses. And here it is displaying, it would display the, end, the date back to the end user, as you saw two screens ago. Today is one that can actually be used commonly in two places. So the first place is in logic. Um, and what today does returns today's date. And it's always the current date in which the end user is running it through the A to J viewer. So you don't have to keep updating dates. It knows based on um, code what the date is. And you can do uh, math with that. So here, I'm determining if a user is within a statute of limitations by doing today minus the variable date and uh, doing some math with that and seeing if it's greater than 90. And if it is greater than 90, they're going to go to a question that says, I'm sorry, you're with with um, you're beyond the statute of limitations, blah, 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 blah. Please find help here or there's no help for you. Another place today can be used is in a date field setting limits to that date field. So if you don't want a user to be able to enter a date in the past, set the minimum to today, just the word today all in caps, instead of setting it to a specific date. If you don't want them to be able to pick a date in the future, so you're asking about things that happened in the past, you can set uh, the maximum to today as well. And A to J will restrict the end user from uh, moving on if they answer, answer a date or pick a date that's outside the range. Depending on the user's browser, it'll either stop them from selecting that date, like the calendar would be grayed out, or um, it, they would not, if they hit continue and put a date that was outside the range, an error message would pop up. Has answered is another very common um, function, and it returns a true or false value based on if a variable has a value. Common way to use it is if you were making a variable called client full name, and you wanted to com combine somebody's first, middle, and last name, because that's how you broke it out in your question, but you didn't want a weird extra space if they didn't answer middle name, then you can test if middle name is answered, and if it is, if has answered, the end user has answered client middle name, set full name to first name, space, middle name, space, last name. Otherwise, if they haven't answered it, they don't have a middle name, then you can set that full name to first name, space, last name. It's just a way, again, to have your final answer um, as clean as possible. If you didn't test for it, if you just had a set client full name to first space, middle space, last, um, then you would have an extra space. Um, between first and last. That would look a little off in the end in the end document. Contains is a brand new function um, for, for A to J6. Contains was requested um, in a feature request and we were able to add it. So if there are things in A to J that you would like to see, send those in on our website under the um, About Us, Contact Us section. There are feature requests and technical reports. They come right to me. I put them into our um, issue queue and we work through them with our programmers. So anyway, Contains is one of these new features. It evaluates if a variable contains a string. So initially it was requested um, because it, um, some of our users in Canada were looking for a way to figure out if their postal code um, contained a specific combination of things. Um, so they wanted to know, that I, 
apparently. Their postal codes are longer than US ones and can contain uh, variations within a postal, like within a zip code area. So they wanted to know specifically if people were coming from a specific area. Um, and they were looking for a way to find out if a variable, a text variable, held a specific uh, string. So what contains does is searches through that variable, trying to find anything that matches whatever value you've set up. And I was trying to think of a way to make this um, more useful in, um, in some of our situations. And so um, my example here is say the, that you as the author want to identify people who say they have issues related to domestic violence when they're answering a question like, what's your legal problem? So you can, um, as an author, start thinking of words that people might use that might trigger um, different scenarios. So this is, a, this is a little bit of building in that expert system, thinking about the way people talk about their legal problems and trying to pull out specific legal issues from what they're telling you. So here, just a simple example, and I used um, if legal problem TE, which is the variable I had set up for the question, what's your legal problem, contains, and the word violence. You could use anything like hit, punch, kick, threaten, any, any of those words you could use, and you can use multiple contain statements, uh, contain function statements as well. But here I use the word violence. So if the end user types in, in a long, you know, like two paragraphs, five paragraphs, four pages long into the text field, a to J will look through all of the values, all the values held by legal problems TE and look for the word violence. If it finds it, I've told A to J to go to another question that says, um, it's called six contains legal problems too, but the text of it says something like, I think you might have an issue with domestic violence, please call 911 or contact our office immediately. And then end if. So this is just a new way to pull out a string from a text variable. Um, question, um, if a, going back to the age function, um, if a child was born between 8-1-1-1999 and 8-24-1999, how do I use age less than 18 to kick them out? Currently, the computation is not working correctly. Um, you should be able to test today minus 8-24-1999 or whatever date they give you and kick you out. Um, we are pushing a fix to dates in our next code push, which I expect to be on Monday. We had to pull it from this Monday, Steve, um, so that might be fixing it. There was an issue with uh, JavaScript, and um, it's called Moment. It's how JavaScript determines the moment it is right now and the time. That was a problem. Um, and so your issue with your computation not working may be related to that. So um, test again on Monday would be my suggestion after we do the code push. Otherwise, email me separately if it's still not working and we can talk about it. Um, so another question about contains. So what if people spell their words wrong? Does the contain function work? So no. Contains is looking specifically for whatever you put as the value it's looking for. So if they spell violence wrong, it's not going to find it. Um, you could do something like VIO and it would look for, for um, just that part of the string. Um, and so it, some of it, you as the author might have to think about ways people might spell things or words they might use um, because you all are the subject matter experts on your forms and how people in your jurisdiction are using it. Um, and so the software only knows to look for whatever you put in there. So if they spell it wrong, um, it's not going to find it. Um, and another clarification of contains. Okay, so again, contains is, oops, sorry. Contains is um, pulling out or is looking through whatever variable you specify and looking for whatever you put in the quotes. So the syntax is contains, which is the function, all in caps, parentheses, bracket around the variable name, comma, and then whatever value you want A to J to look for in this variable, in quotes, close the uh, parentheses. So you're telling A to J, test if to see if this variable contains 
this value. So you can put whatever string you want here to test, and A to J will look for that specific string. So the more specific you get, like domestic space violence, A to J will look specifically for that. If you put uh, DOM and put that in um, the quotes, then A to J will look for if anywhere in the, in the variable DOM. Is, is contained within. So it's depending on you to be um, as specific or general as you need. Um, oh, so sorry, the confusing part was that I have a question that the name of my question says contains. That's just in the um, sample that the guided interview I created. It reminds me what I'm trying to show you in this question. This question could be called six dash domestic violence completely um, this is just the name of the question it's not at all related to the function um, it could be called anything okay um, I see that I have a hand raised so let me check that real quick Oop. okay sorry no hands are raised right now um, are there any other questions about contains before I move on So ordinal is the uh, next function that can be used in A to J author. And what ordinal does is it returns the ordinal form of a number, and it is usually used with a repeat question um, and its counting variable. So here, for example, it would return first, fourth, 75th, 412th, whatever number um, you give A to J, it will return the ordinal value of. The syntax is just ordinal, and my counting variable, which here is child count, because I don't have a space, I don't have brackets. Um, and the text here is what is your ordinal asset count asset. And here in the screenshot, it's showing what is your first asset, because this is the first time I've gone through the loop. So it will keep it incrementing as the asset count, as the counting variable increments, the ordinal will increment each time your end user sees it. So what is your second asset? What is your third, fourth, 412, that kind of thing. Sum is a way to return the total value of all values held for a repeating variable, a number variable. So for example, you ask the end user for their monthly expenses one at a time in a repeat loop. Do you have another monthly expense? What is it? How much does it cost you? Do you have another? Do you have another? Keep going on. All of those values, the amount of their monthly expense is held in client expense value NU. It's one variable that is set to hold multiple values. If you wanna know then what are your total monthly expenses, and you don't want to have to make your end user get out a calculator or a piece of paper and figure out what their total monthly expenses are. Just use the information they've already given you in client expense value NU and the function sum to set a total expenses variable to the sum of everything held by that um, repeat variable that was related to their expenses. Same thing for income. Um, you can ask for a source of income and how much the income is per month, and then you can add it up total monthly, and then you can even do math, like times 12, to find out what their yearly income is, that kind of thing. Whatever your form uh, requires, you can do some of the math for your end user. Another question. Um, the question is, so does the sum function replace A to J4 expense and U was choose to equal the total of expense 1 and 2? So sum is not new. It works the same way that it did in A to J4. A to J4, you also use sum function to total all the values held um, by a repeat variable. If you don't use sum to set that total um, a new variable total expense, what will be passed in the repeat variable is um, expense one, expense two, expense three. It won't add up all the expenses, it'll just keep them as separate line items um, in the variable. Some, that's weird, I don't, some reminders uh, and additional resources. So there are additional functions like dollar, um, 
round trunk eight, round two, which rounds to two decimal places, trunk two, which truncates to two decimal or to two places. Um, those functions, you can find a list of all the functions here at uh, adajauthor.org slash content slash functions. It's also in uh, this, this is a direct URL to chapter seven, the function section um, of our authoring guide, but you can get there just by going to the learn tab, the authoring guide, and then chapter seven, which has a section on functions. Always remember to uh, wrap any variables that have brackets, um, most of the functions require you to put a parentheses also around um, the brackets, and you can use macros as well to call out functions. So you can convert their total assets NU, which would be um, stored as just a number, into dollar, which formats it into the American dollar um, with a um, a period and two like the the two um, places after the decimal point. So again, chapter seven of the authoring guide. Um, you can always email me if you have questions, Jessica at Cali, and I have a new office number. If you have my old office number and you call it, you will get a voicemail uh, message that gives you this number as well, in case you don't write it down. Otherwise, it's under the handout section here uh, in the GoToMeeting webinar. And this whole slide deck is there, so you can refer to it later. I will try to quickly post this to our YouTube channel. I'm a little behind in our editing and posting. Um, and our next webinar is coming up in two weeks because this one was pushed back. Um, so September 7th at 11. Are there um, questions or concerns anybody has? Feel free to raise your hand or put your question um, in the question box and I can handle those too. Okay, um, thank you all for attending and I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you.